we're blessed too. Do you know when you start living for God, the people around you start getting your blessings too, your anointing? Because we serve a God of more. The ships were sinking. And see, Simon did great. Simon knew right here. He wasn't just like, he wasn't just talking about the fish. He came to God and, and just started worshiping him and realizing who he was in front of him. That's how good he is. All right, let's take another, let's take another story here. Matthew 14. Let's go to Matthew 14. So you go to the left in your Bible. Matthew 14, main verses are 14, 20, but let's back up. So let me start off. Uh, let's go to uh, 14. So Matthew 14, 14, Cameron. Jesus went forth and saw a great multitude and was moved with compassion and don't we have a great God that he is moved with compassion when he sees us? Praise God. And he healed their sick. And when it was evening, his disciples came to him saying, this is a desert place. Oh, my goodness. Even if you're in a desert place, God has something for you. And in that time is now past and send the multitude away that they may go into the visions and buy themselves victuals. But Jesus said unto them, they need not depart. Give ye them to eat. And they said unto him, we have here five loaves and two fish. And he said, bring them hither to me. This story right here is the story of the, of the feeding of the 5,000. It's actually in all four Gospels. That's how incredible of a story it was that all of them accounted this story. It was a little boy that gave the five loaves of fish, and, uh, the five loaves and two fish. Bring them hither to me. Verse 19, and he commanded the multitude to sit down on the grass and took the five loaves and the two fish and looking up to heaven, he blessed and break and gave the loaves to his disciples and the disciples to the multitude. And they did all eat and were filled. And they took up the fragments that remained 12 baskets full. And they that had eaten were about 5,000 men beside the women and children. So 5,000 men, but now you have children. So we're, thinking, we're talking about 15,000 people that he fed. They were hungry. See, God doesn't care how much you need. He can provide it. He can provide it. Don't think, well, my need is too big. He can provide it. Look at this. Check this out. I like this verse right here. Where are we at right here? Verse 20, and they did all eat. Did only some of them eat? All ate and were what? Filled. And they took up fragments and remained 12 back. You know what that is? That's leftovers. Some people don't eat leftovers. I eat some leftovers. But see, when God does something, there's some leftovers. That's how you know God is doing something because there's extra in it. It wasn't just enough, but it overflows. Do you understand that, church? You say, is God doing this for me? Well, if there's an overflow, if there's some leftover in your life, then you know, man, it was God. It was Jesus. That's how you know. That's a good, that's a good way to indicate, hey, is this God moving? Well, do you have any leftovers? Did you get a job that, that well, you were able to just, uh, just, just buy everyone uh, birthday presents, you know? That's how you know God is doing something. You got a job, you're like, man, it, it, was, it was extra. There was some leftovers in my life. All right, we're going to do it again. We're going to see uh, Matthew 15, 37. It, it should be just a page over. 1537. So this is the story of him feeding the 4,000. Where are we at? 1537. Let's go to 32. Jesus called his disciples unto him and said, I have compassion on the multitude. Thank you, Jesus, for compassion. You know, because sometimes we're like, man, God, do you ever, am I the only one? Lord, do you know what I'm going through? 
Do you feel me? God feels you. God knows what you're going through. God has compassion for you. Don't ever think God doesn't care about you. It says it right here. God had compassion over not once but twice over the multitude of people. Because they continued with me now three days and have nothing to eat. And I will not send them away fasting, lest they faint in the way. And his disciples said unto him, hence should we have so much bread in the wilderness to fill this so great a multitude. Oh, my goodness. Isn't it just like us when God's already done stuff in our past, has done super rise, we still don't believe. We have such little faith. They just fed 5,000. There's not even that many people as, as there were 15,000 people. There's less people on this story. But here, we, here they are. How are we going to feed them, Lord? I'm, I was like, were you not with me? Just over the other hill? <laughs> how many loaves? How much, what do you have? See, God just wants you to bring what you have. Man, goodness, my goodness. And they said seven and a few little fish. And he commanded the multitude to sit down on the ground. And he took the seven. See, you see that? God's blessings, check this out. God's blessings doesn't come from your work ethic. He says, sit down, relax. I'm going to bless you. I'm going to bless you in your need. You don't got to work towards it. That's how good Jesus is. That's how, how, how his grace is sufficient. He said, sit down and relax. He didn't say, okay, now I need you to run this, run, run a mile here, run back, and by the time you come back, I'll have some food. I need you to go over here, chop up some wood, we're going to cook it. He said, just sit down and sit down on the grass. That's what he told him twice. He commanded to sit down on the ground, and he took the seven loaves of fish and gave thanks and break them, and he gave to the disciples and the disciples to the multitude. And they did what? All eat and were filled. And they took up the broken meat that was left. Seven baskets full. Can everyone say leftovers? Leftovers. There were some leftovers again. That's how you know God is doing something. See, God is a God of more and more. Mas y mas. Let's get it. If you don't know any Spanish, you're going to learn mas y mas today. More and more. I mean, everyone wants, see, you want more of everything else besides God. I want more money. I want more of this world. I want more of this. I want more of that. When are we going to come to a place where I need more of God in my life? Because God can fill you. God can fill you. God can fill your needs. Are you hearing me? And these are some of the promises that God has for us. Cameron, can you pull up Hebrews 6.14? <laughs> Everyone say more and more. Yes. Hebrews 6.14 says, I will surely bless you and I will surely multiply thee. Multiply what? Multiply your blessing. Multiply your anointing. Multiply your overcoming life. Genesis 16.10 Genesis 16, 10, moreover, the angel of the Lord said to her, I will greatly, greatly multiply your descendants to that they will be too many to count. Can't even count your blessings. Genesis 12, 2. Genesis 12, 2. And I will make you a great nation, and I will bless you and make your name great, and so you shall be a blessing. You have more potential for the kingdom of God than you think, church. Let me repeat that again. You have more potential for the kingdom of God than you think. There's more in you. God has more in you. God has created more in you. Youth, elders, parents, there is more. There is more for you. I had a friend, his name was Jamie, and I played football, football for Cedar Hill, and I was, I was, I was a, a good athlete there. And he, he went to another school. He, he was kind of, I know, he was like a weird stage in his life, but he was a good friend of mine. He was a little younger than me. He was tall, but he's kind of lanky, you know. And he's like, Donnie, show me how to lift weights. And I was like, yeah, I'll show you how to lift weights. And I said, listen. Don't worry about what other people are thinking here. You're just going to, listen, because I saw potential in him. I said, but you just got to get to working out. 
you know, and it's going to be all right. And so this is Cedar, this is Cedar Hill. People are lifting, young kids, they're just repping 225 pounds, you know, after school and just lifting weights. I mean, I, I wasn't even that strong, but, you know, I, I was athletic, and I just said, don't worry about that. And he went on there. We put the bar in five pounds. And he was just struggling. I said, come on, bro. Come on. You do it. You do it. You know, after eight reps. He's like, come on. And he's, he told me how embarrassing it was. It doesn't matter. But he kept on lifting weights. And it's so funny. I don't know how, I don't know how it happened. But all his family is my, my height. He ended up being 6'4". The biggest is 275. We could bench 410 pounds eight times, repping it. But see, that was his potential. He didn't start off there. You see that? He didn't start off there. But someone, his friend had to tell us, hey, listen, just keep working at it. Just keep going. And look at that. What if I say, well, that, man, I'm too embarrassed. There's, there's no way. I can't even lift the bar. But look at that. 410, that's a lot. I've never been able to lift that much. But he was repping it. Eight reps, what is high, his highest strength, turned out, turned out being 6'4". There is more potential for you in the kingdom of God than you think. There's more in you. Your story's not over. You're, and your story has just begun. Do you understand that? There's a story of, of, of Buster Douglas. Do you all know who Buster Douglas is? All right. Do you know who Mike Tyson is? He's one of the first ones to beat Mike Tyson. All right? Let me tell you, Buster Douglas got knocked down. I think it was the first or second round, got knocked down. Nobody ever got knocked down by Mike Tyson and got back up during that time. Nobody. It was almost a 10 count. He was stumbling. Four, three, two, one. Ding, 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 ding. He got saved by the bell. He got saved by the bell. He goes to the corner. The whole world is like, yep, that's it. He's done. It's a wrap. Mike Tyson wins again. That's what everyone was saying. He's out. Mike is just going to hammer it in. Once he comes back out, that's it. Mike's going to finish him. That's exactly what Mike Tyson came out to do. I got him. He was thinking, I got him. I got him knocked down. I got this kid against the rope. Listen to me. Listen. The devil got you against the ropes. You can't give up. You can't give up. You can't give in. Listen, if it was easy, everybody would be doing it. And this world and the devil got you backed up. I need you to know what Buster Douglas did. Buster Douglas started fighting back. He didn't give up after getting knocked down by Mike Tyson. He started fighting back. The whole world was shocked. Goliath has been knocked down. What happened? He knocked down Mike Tyson. And when they went to Buster Douglas. He won the fight. He won the fights. What happened? Buster Douglas said, listen to me. It was really simple. Before my mother died, she told the whole world that I was going to beat Mike Tyson, that I was going to be a champion. And two days later, before the fight, his mother died. See, he remembered what his mother said. He said, you're going to be the champion. He was, his mother was telling everyone, my son's going to be the champion. I'm telling you today, Jesus has told you you're more than a conqueror. You're the head and not the tail. You got to start rising back up and you got to start fighting. You got to start fighting back. Are you feeling me, church? There's more potential in you in the kingdom of God than you think. There is more and more for you. We got to start fighting back. You got to start fighting back. There's more potential. I'm going to do one more weight, uh, weightlifting illustration. I, I remember in, in junior high, you would... You would test for your max. I know it was, your, it was freshman year, and you would just do as much as you can. And one of the kids, whose name was TJ, and he's struggling. He's like, <laughs> you know, everyone's getting their max. He's like, <laughs> I can't I kill. You know, put it back on. You know, and, and it's like, coach, I gotta do less, cause you know, you kind of just try and you add weight as you go. You know, you're like, okay, boom, you hit it. All right, add, add five more pounds. Let's, let's find out your max. That's what the coaches want to know. How much can you max out? What's the heaviest you can lift? So if you did it real easy, let's add more weight. And you're like, but you finished it? 
Let's add a little bit more weight. So he came to his third one. He's like, I can't go. go, go, go. And he dropped it. And and they had to pick it up and put it back on the rack. And he said, TJ, close your eyes. We're going to take off the weight. Coach goes. And Coach had us add five more additional pounds to what he was struggling. He says, TJ, close your eyes. I just want you to lift it. Close your eyes and I want you to push as hard as you can. Took it. Ugh. Didn't even struggle with it. And he said, Tina, get up. He was like, what? See, there's more potential in you than you think. Don't let your eyes deceive you. Just listen to what God has for you and start pushing. Start pushing. Start closing your eyes praying. Oh, Lord, work me through this. Work me through this. Start, start listening. Amen, amen. <laughs> so, excuse me. So I want to go to the story of Gideon. So I don't know if y'all know who Gideon is. It's funny that I'm telling this story. I, I actually did Bible studies when I was in school, and I was part of this youth, I guess. And... I guess y'all call it the, what, P7 or whatever? Well, the youth, I, I had, they called it Gideon's Army. And I would put out flyers at school and say, hey, Gideon's Army Bible study. I didn't even know who Gideon was. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I just know I love Jesus and I wanted to teach Bible studies. And I was like, okay, cool, Gideon. And I, I remember the whole time that I was doing these Bible studies, Gideon's Army, and, and putting them on little flyers for them to come out. I was like, who's Gideon? I don't know who he is. I didn't know his story or anything. So if you don't know this story, it's okay. I'm going to tell it to you, all right? So Gideon is, is, was, a, was a mighty warrior. He, he did a greater victory than the movie uh, 300. So I don't know if you ever seen the movie 300, but it, that, it was a violent movie. So little kids, don't watch that movie. But, I mean, if you read the Bible, it's pretty violent, too. <laughs> it is pretty violent. So if you don't know that, you haven't been reading your Bible. So, but anyway, the story on, on, on 300 were the Greeks versus the Persians. And there was King Xerxes. Xerxes? I know my wife was tomato, tomato. Xerxes, Xerxes. And so it was supposed to be Spartans, and there was 300 warriors. And, but then they also had 700 Thespians and 400 Thebans. And they fought against uh, an army of 100,000 Persians. But Gideon's story is the real 300 story. That's the real 300 story. There were only 300. Literally 300. So, it, you know, the movie on the 300, the 300, but then there were some other people that died too with them. No, Gideon, and then no one died with Gideon's 300. All right, so this is the real I mean, if you want, a, you want a, a, a story that will, you know, inspire you, that, this is it. So Gideon led an army of 300 against 120 Midianites. 120,000. They're like, that's not much. 300, that's, wait, 100, that's less. No, 120,000 Midianites. What's great, it's crazy is that, that God started him with 32,000, when I go, 32,000 men, and then it went down to 300 men, and they won. And they won. So I'm going to tell you the, I'm going to do like a movie, show you the end part of it, and then we're going to like do like a pre, prequel of, of the Gideon story. So Judges 7, 19 through 24. Gideon, I mean, sorry, Judges 7, chapter 19 through 24. So Gideon and the hundred men that were with him came unto the outside of the camp in the beginning of the middle of the watch, and they had but newly set, newly set the watch, and they blew the trumpets and break the pitchers that were in their hands, and the three companies blew the trumpets and break the pitchers and held the lamps in their left hand and the trumpets in their right hand to blow. Did y'all hear that? Look at that. I like this. The three companies blew the trumpets and break the pitchers, and they held the lamps in their left hand and the trumpets in their right hand. Man, you need a fire, and you need a worship. He had their lamps here and their trumpets here. 
You need some fire in your life for God, and you need some worship, a voice of worship, a voice that cries out a shout of victory in your life to be victorious. Think about that. God could have done it any way, but why that? You got one hand here, a lamp, fire. You need some fire in your heart, fire in your feet. Come on. And the sword of the Lord and the Gideon, and they stood every man in his place round about the camp, and all the host ran and cried and fled. And the 300 blew the trumpets, and the Lord set every man's sword against the, his fellow, even throughout all the hosts. And the host fled to Beth, she, uh, Sheeta in Zerath, and the border of Abel, Mahala, and Tabith. And the men of Israel gathered themselves together out of Naph Naphtali and out of Asher and out of Manasseh and pursued the Midianites. And Gideon sent messengers throughout all Mount Ephraim, saying, Come down against the Midianites and take before them the waters unto Beth, Barah, and Jordan. Then all the men in Ephraim gathered themselves together and took the waters unto Beth, Barah, and Jordan. They won with 300 men. Because of God. This is the story. 300. 300. I know, I know you're not understanding. I mean, if you, if you took $300 and made $120,000 with it, who would like that? You made an investment. Like that. that's, that's some big numbers. So from 300, see, now when we talk about money, y'all understand that. You're like, oh, that's, that's a good investment. That's what they were coming against. Or say you had $120,000 and now you only have 300 bucks. <laughs> See the difference of that number? That's how miraculous it was. And they started going and they started charging. They were, the, the Midianites were killing each other. They were so scared of Gideon, they didn't know who to fight. They were killing each other, running for their life. Now, that's the, that's, that's, that's the end of it. That's the victorious story right there. Now, let's go to Judges 7. Did I tell you there's more in you than you think? Did I tell you that? There's more. I'm going to repeat it again. No matter where you are, God has more for you. No matter how long you've been in this, maybe you said, you know, I've been doing this a long time. There's more for you. God has more. There's more anointing. There's more things that God is calling you to do in a ministry. He's going to start activating things in your life and in your spirit. You're like, he's going to, he's just going to start convicting you. Because God has more for us, church. This is the time for more. You know the world is getting more evil. It's time for the church to rise up. We need more. I mean, I just heard of a concert of people dying. Something like eight people dying. The world is getting evil, guys. We got to start moving up. There's a calling in our lives that's more. It's not where you're at. Don't be comfortable where you're at. We need more of God. <laughs> Comfort is, is, is the enemy of greatness. Do you understand that? Comfort is the enemy of greatness. God has greater things for you. You know, they say that, you know, where the richest place is? Like, is it in Italy or is it? I don't know, Europe, I, I don't know, is it here in New York, California, Texas, is Texas the richest place? China, they own a lot of stuff, are they the richest? You know what they say the richest place is? Graveyards. Those were the, they say this for business-wise, those are the businesses that never came to fruition. Those are the, the books that never were written. Those were the people that didn't take the risk in doing what they were doing. But think about this. What about the souls that weren't one? The anointing that just died. The calling that's just buried in those graveyards. Because you didn't know there was more in you. There's more in you, church. There's more. Let God pull it out of you. Let God pull it out of you. All right, so we're going to go back to, to Gideon here. Chapter 7. 
Let's find what it is. So this is what's going on. So, oh, I'm in the wrong area here. I'm in Matthew. I'm not going to find it. Where is it? Bookmark. All right. So what's going on is the Midianites have taken over Israel. So if you don't know the story, let me back up so you understand what, what it is. There's, it's so bad that whatever the Israelites do, and this is what the enemy wants to do, whatever you do, he just wants to devour it. So the Midianites, whatever they grew, they devoured it. If you had sheep and, and goats and, and whatever cattle that you had, they take it. They said it was so bad, they would come in there like, like grasshoppers on the land and just devour it. Oh, that's ours, that's ours, that's ours, that's ours. The whole, the whole uh, soldiers and the armies would just come and devour everything. It was so bad, they, they were hiding in caves is what was happening here. So God sent a prophet telling them in verse here, we're in chapter 6. Chapter 6, verse 8. Oh, no, let's go 6. And the Israelites were greatly impoverished because of the Midianites. And the children of Israel cried unto the Lord. And it came to pass when the children of Israel cried unto the Lord because of the Midianites. So now you know why they're crying, okay? That the Lord sent a prophet unto the children of Israel, which said unto them, Thus saith the Lord of Israel, Israel, I brought you up from Egypt and brought you forth out of the house of bondage. So I like that, you know, he didn't send a judge. He didn't send a warrior. He sent a prophet. He sent a, a preacher. Sent about hearing. You need to hear this. Hearing changes things. You understand that? Hearing changes The prophet is here. God sent a prophet preaching to start working in these people. And, and, and God didn't I love it. God will remind you of what he's done for you. Like, what you're going through is nothing. I've already done it in your past. I've done greater things in your past. So whatever you're confronting right now, it's not bigger than what than God can do or what he's already done. Okay? So we're going to go and skip over to verse 12. And the angel of the Lord appeared. No, no. Sorry. Verse 11, and there came an angel of the Lord and sat under the oak, which was Ophrah, not Oprah, Ophrah, that pertained unto Joash, the Abazrite, and the son of Gideon, threshed wheat by the windpress to hide it from the Midianites. And the angel of the Lord appeared unto him and said unto him, the Lord is with thee, thou mighty man of valor. All right, so verse 11. So the Lord came to Gideon. You know that guy that just defeated all the 120,000? He's hiding. Everyone say hiding. Hiding. And what is he doing? He's threshing wheat in where? A wine press. Well, that's normal. But it's not. Okay? That's like saying you're washing your car in your living room. That's what that means. So if you don't know what that was, so you, you, when you thresh wheat, you would try to go to like a hill or a place that's windy, and you would throw it all up so the, the shaft will go away, and then all you have is the wheat. So if you're hiding in a closed area, I mean, how effective is that? See, when you're fearful and you're not trusting God, you make things harder for yourself than it ought to be. Things that should be easy, you make them harder because you're not trusting in the Lord. Can you imagine washing your car in your living room? Washing your car in the living room because he was, I'm, I'm a, I, don't, I don't want them to steal my car, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to wash my car in the living room. Washing your, your motorcycle, Austin, in the living room, your dad allow you to do that? <laughs> That's what he was doing. He was hiding in a wine press. And the Lord is with thee, thou mighty man of valor. And Gideon said unto him, O oh my Lord, if the Lord be with us, why then is there all this fallen before us? So he started complaining. So God, in 1 Corinthians 1 through 27 and 30, it says, But God chose the foolish things of the world 
to shame the wise. God chose the weak things of the world to shame the strong. God chose the lowly things of this world and despised things and the things that are not to nullify the things that are so that no one may boast before him. It is because of him you are in Christ Jesus who has become for us wisdom from God that is our righteousness, holiness, and redemption. There's more for you. No matter where you think you come from or where, who you are. So Gideon starts complaining. Verse 14, and the Lord looked upon him and said, go in this thy might and thou shalt save Israelites from the hand of Midianites. Have not I sent thee. Verse 15, this is us. And he said unto them, O my Lord, wherewith shall I save Israel? Behold, my family is poor in Manasseh, and I am the least in my father's house. Have y'all ever felt low in your life? Unwanted, like you're not going to make it through. This is Gideon, the same one that just, I told you, won victory over the Midianites. Only 300 men. Here he is saying, listen, my family, you don't know where I come from. I'm not adequate. I'm not good enough. I don't know how to read the Bible. I've never really raised my, God is asking for more of you today. I'm going to tell you that right now. There is more in you. There was more in getting, see, God doesn't. You don't identify with your circumstance. You identify what God identifies you with. And see, God identified Gideon as a mighty man of valor while he was hiding. Your present circumstance does not identify you. Jesus Christ does. Your present circumstance does not identify you, but Jesus does. And he even said, I am the least. So not only was his family horrible, out of the family, I'm the So now none of you guys, if you are the most inadequate person for God to use, guess what? You qualify. You qualify. You qualify. From that point up, you qualify. That's the standard right there. The least, the lowest, the bottom, that is the standard. And anything above that, you can do God's work. You can do God's calling in life. You can be a blessing to someone. You have an anointing in your life. You have a calling. Because you qualify. The lowest one, God used. God has more for you. There's more for you. Now, I want to take verse 25 real quick. You know, what does it take sometimes, though, to get where God wants us to be? And it came to pass the same night that the Lord said unto him, Take thy father's young bullock, even the second bullock of seven years old, and throw down the altar of Baal that thy father hath, and cut down the grove that is by it. Sometimes the call of God and anointing always deals with your own idols and heart first. That's the first step that God had Gideon do. You know, in Acts, they said, what must we do? Repent. You know? The call of God in anointing always deals with your own idols and heart first. That's where you start. So you hear this call, but there is more for you, but we got to take care of this. There's some things you got to take care of. I love the cross because you're. Your sin is greater than you know, and you are loved more than you can imagine. You have one hand here, but you don't realize your, your sin is, is greater than you know. And on this side over here, but you guess what? You are loved more than you can imagine. 
So we got to deal if we're moving in, call God, you're feeling that. You're like, you know what? There is more. You know what? There's more worship in you. There's more worship in you. There's a more of a desire to get closer to God than you have. There's more. God has more. He's not done. He has more for you. See, Gideon was hiding, and I find it, we're actually in hyphen class, that God's first experience with man after sin was them hiding from him. See, God called Gideon. A mighty man of valor. I love it. Not only, he could have just said, you're a, a man of valor. You're a warrior. But you're a mighty man. So he even did, gives a description of how great of a warrior you are. God could have called us your, your conquerors. But he says, no, you are more than conquerors. You see that? More. But Gideon was hiding. Gideon was hiding. So you ought to ask yourself, well, where are you hiding? When God calls us for more, what are you hiding behind? God asks, Adam, Adam, where are you? It's not that God doesn't know where he is. But it's because Adam doesn't know where Adam is. I'm closing. Let's stand up. God's calling out to you today. And he has more for you. He has a more of a calling and anointing for you. But you might be hiding. Hiding behind your work. Hiding behind your career. Hiding behind your busyness. Hiding behind your worship. This is good enough. Hiding behind your church attendance. Where are you hiding? Adam, where are you? God's calling out. Not that he doesn't know where you're at, but he wants you to identify where are you in my plan for you. Where are you right now? Where do you see yourself? And to do that, you have to admit, I'm hiding. I know you have more for me, God, but I'm hiding. I know you have more work. I, I have so much more to give you, God. God has given everything. He didn't stop halfway and say, that's enough. He gave it all. To know God is to know what you should do. Where are you? They say the most, what you most need to find in your life is where you have not been looking. There's things in our life that you want. You're like, man, I need to find that. But it's the least place where you want to look. You don't want to look in that mess. I know it's somewhere in there, but I don't want to go through all of that. God came to Gideon and is hiding because... He knew he could do more for the Israelites. He was more than a coward hiding in a wine press, doing things that doesn't make sense, that he was a mighty man of valor. God is saying, there's more to you than your church attendance and being here. It's time for you to get going. It's time for you to get involved. God wants to come to you in your hiding today. He has a word for you. 
and the word of encouragement for you. Even in your hiding. Even in your hiding, he has a word for you. He didn't go to Gideon and say, you know what? What are you doing? You're hiding. I love the first words that he said to Gideon. The angel of the Lord appeared unto him and said unto him, the Lord is with thee. Not a word of condemnation or ridicule or criticism. But God wants to know, listen, I'm with you. I'm with you. I've been with you. I know what you're going through. It's just something about knowing that God, I just need you with me. And God knows that. So once a day, come to the altar and step away from your hiding. Start thinking about things. What am I hiding from God that I can give to him? Because we all know God has given us everything. Come to the altar and say, God, here I am. I want to be with you. I want to give you more than what I've been given because you've given me all. There's things I've been holding back that I want to give you, God. I want to give you my thoughts, my heart, my love. I just want to surrender to you. more for you church let's give him some worship let's give him some time let God just start speaking to you God I'm just praying that you would draw the things that you have for us start pulling them out God You have more for us, God. You have more for this church. You have more for these, these marriages. You have more for these, this youth, God. You have more for this church, this city. And we just want to surrender to you, God. If you don't know God, if you haven't been away from him, this is time to give him more. Jesus, thank you, Lord. We just surrender to you, God. Make me a house. Make me a house of Make me a house. Make me a house of prayer. Make me a house of 
them prayer. Lord, make me a house. Make me a house of prayer.
God is not done. We're going to baptize Sabrina this morning. And this is Brandy's daughter. And Brandy came to church this morning. And she's just worshiped God and just been magnifying God. Praise God. Um, so, hallelujah. Isn't God good? <laughs> 